You wanna hear something silly? Bears can't parallel park. You wanna hear something even sillier? Darwin thought that bears could turn into whales. Back in the 1800s when Darwin first published The Origin of Species, this is exactly what he said. And he was brutally mocked by scientists of his day for thinking something so ridiculous. He even retracted the idea from later editions of his book. But here's the kicker. Scientists of today think essentially the same thing. <laughs> Stupid Darwin thinks bears could have turned into whales. How ridiculous. Everyone knows these wolf, pig, weasel, hippo things or it turned into whales. <laughs> My, how the tables have turned. Back in the 80s and the 90s, a series of fossils were found that rocked the evolutionary landscape. Paleontologists thought that they had found a clear transitional series of fossils documenting the evolution of whales. University of Chicago evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne says in his book Why Evolution is True, whales happen to have an excellent fossil record, courtesy of their aquatic habits and robust, easily fossilized bones. This is one of our best examples of an evolutionary transition. Wow, one of the best. Let's take a look at the story behind whale evolution. Is it a good argument or not? So according to Coyne, whale evolution is such great evidence since we have a chronologically ordered series of fossils. And it goes something like this. The sequence begins with a raccoon-sized animal called Endohyus, living 48 million years ago. 52 million years ago, we see a wolf-sized creature called Pachycetus, which is a bit more whale-like than Endohyus. At 50 million years ago, there's the remarkable Ambulocetus. Rhodocetus, 47 million years ago, is even more aquatic. Finally, at 40 million years ago, we find the fossils of Basilosaurus and Dorodon before we have our modern whales. Let's take a look a little bit closer at this chronologically ordered series of fossils. If you're paying attention, you might be thinking something fishy is going on here, but no, you'd be wrong. That would not be a bad pun because whales are mammals, not fish. But also, yes, something mammally was going on here. Granting the standard Darwinian dates for these fossils, Endohyus is dated as far younger than his supposed descendants. And he's not the only one, more on that later. This is common practice in evolutionary analysis to ignore where species actually show up in the fossil record and place them wherever makes Darwinian sense. Creating what are called chronological inversions or ghost lineages. <gasps> oh, that's so spooky. The fossil record often reveals fossils out of the order that they're supposed to be in. For just a couple of other examples, let's take a look at bird evolution. It's supposed to go theropod dinosaurs evolving into birds, with the fossil Archaeopteryx being evidence of this as an intermediate fossil. But the problem is he appears long before the dinosaurs he was supposed to have descended from. Evolution also got a big stick in its spokes with this guy, Tiktaalik, a fish-like creature that was for years crowned as the smoking gun transitional fossil of fish starting to go from the sea to the land. Brilliant evidence, just what they expected. Until in 2010, fossil footprints of true tetrapods were found in Poland long before they were supposed to have evolved. And all of a sudden, Tiktaalik was dethroned as a transitional fossil because again, the dates are all out of order. Hey everybody, I'd like you to meet my grandpa. Oh, so cute. Is, is that his name or? No, his name is Seymour. He is my grandpa. What? Doesn't make any sense. Back to the chronologically ordered series of fossils, Basilosaurus and Dorodon are considered fully aquatic whales. They're not a transition to anything. Okay, maybe they're just trying to pad their numbers a little bit. Big deal. Surely the rest of the fossils are intermediate and transitional, right? Well, that depends on how you define intermediate. In paleontology, intermediate doesn't mean what we think it means. Like my parents are intermediate between me and my Gam Gam and Pop Pop. Oh, hello, sweetie. Hi, Gam Gam. Oh my, how tall you've grown. Ah, but you're so skinny. Would you like your Gam Gam to make you a nice pot pie? You know, staying healthy. By intermediate, paleontologists usually mean a fossil is merely morphologically intermediate. In other words, if a fossil has features of a supposed ancestor and descendant, then it is classified as an intermediate or transitional fossil. But with that definition, I would be a morphological intermediate between this jockey and this professional basketball player. But that doesn't say anything about lineage, whether I'm an ancestor or descendant of either one. We could be completely unrelated or even chronologically out of order, that wouldn't matter. The very thing they're trying to prove, the ancestral relationship or how they came about, is pure assumption. 
This is how they can say there's tons of intermediate fossils and be technically correct, while at the same time skeptics can say, yeah, there aren't really any intermediate fossils and also be correct. The fossil evidence is so meager that Darwinists, in order to prove evolutionary ancestry, they have to use a slippery definition that no one would accept in other areas of life. But for the sake of argument, let's ignore that problem because there's another one. Is there even enough time for the transition from land to water to hypothetically take place? Again, taking the standard evolutionary numbers for granted, we've got about 8 to 10 million years to go from the land mammal, Pachycetus, to fully aquatic whales. That sure seems like a whole lot of time. It's almost enough time for me to watch a Lord of the Rings marathon with someone who has a really small bladder. But is it enough time for whales to have evolved? The field of population genetics is devoted to calculating how long something like this would take. In the past, it was assumed that this was relatively simple to do, as easy as falling off a log. But more recently, scientists at Cornell University calculated how long it would take for different organisms to evolve two simple, beneficial mutations. For fruit flies, with their relatively large population sizes and speedy generation times, it'd only take a few million years for two mutations to become fixed. For larger mammals like humans, who have much smaller population sizes and longer generation times, they calculated it would take over 200 million years. Again, that's only for two beneficial mutations. Okay, so where would whales and their supposed ancestors fall on that time scale? They're not as quick to reproduce as flies, but quicker than humans. So for two simple beneficial mutations, that's supposed to take roughly 43.3 million years. So the evidence shows, using their own assumptions and calculations, that they don't even have one quarter of the time needed for even two simple mutations. And it takes quite a lot of changes to go from the land to the water, it turns out, including some of these lovely attributes. So, how many mutations does it take to change a packet? Ooh, I know this joke. Three. One to hold it and two to turn the ladder. How many mutations does it take to change a pachycetus to a whale? Hmm, not where I would have gone with that joke, but what do I know? To put that in context, take giraffes and their derpy little short-necked pals, the okapi. They're quite similar, and a recent paper studied their differences and found surprisingly 70 different genes that likely contributed to the giraffe's appearance. If animals that similar required 70 gene changes for basically just a longer neck and stronger heart, it's a pretty safe bet that animals as different as Pachycetus and whales would require at least as many, and more likely many thousands more. But it gets worse. Recently a new Bacillosaurid fossil was found in Antarctica that, even using the most generous dates for Darwinists, cuts down the time available for the whale transition to about half of the already not enough time of 8 million years, and could even place fully aquatic whales before Rhodocetus before Ambulocetus and contemporary with, or even before Pachycetus, destroying the entire fossil timeline. So is the whale transitional fossil series any good? Well, once you take into account the padding of their numbers, the chronological inversions, the ghost lineages, more recent fossil finds that discredit the timeline, and their creative use of definitions for what it even means to be a transitional fossil, the mathematical problems using their own numbers, they're all very clever tricks. But once you see how all of this works, it's quite a bit less impressive. To be fair, scientists aren't doing this maliciously. <laughs> they really believe that evolution is just obviously true. So they reason, whether we have 8 million years or 4 million years, lots of fossils or no fossils. If evolution is true and we have whales today, then they must have been able to evolve, regardless of any problems that pop up. But if you don't presuppose evolution, if you treat it as a hypothesis rather than an assumption, then problems like these become far more difficult to hand wave away. So these fossil finds certainly are interesting and worth debating, but there's a lot more to it than the uncritical, glossy, one-sided story being told. If this is one of the best evidences for evolution, what does that mean for their other evidence that's not as good? Hmm. You know what? I never noticed this, but my pet bat has the same number of fingers as my pet alligator. Isn't that a quinky dink? 
One of the main arguments Darwin used for his theory was that of homology, these odd similarities between very different animals. Why would they be so similar unless they were related? And this does make sense, after all, take siblings, they look pretty similar, they're closely related. Then take cousins or third uncles or former roommates, or that weird guy down the street who's always going on about how he's a real human, but you're pretty sure he's just a stack of goblins in a trench coat. You can't fool me, I'm onto you. Anywho, Darwin wasn't the first one to notice this, but he did harness it as a central proof in the origin of species. It's to this day used as great evidence for evolution, but is it really? Here's the story. Careful observers for a long time have noticed that very different creatures have very similar bits. These sorts of ideas date all the way back to Aristotle. If we fast forward to the 1800s, anatomist Sir Richard Owen coined a term for these observations, homology. Take a look at this guy. He's got an arm that starts with one bone, followed by two bones, and then lots of tiny bones for the wrist and fingers and whatnot. Great for grabbing stuff and high-fiving. Whales and dogs have basically the same structure, but they're not so good at those things. Why in the world would that be the case? Before Darwin, biologists chalked this up to common design. Just like a painter has a particular style and reuses similar colors or themes that he likes across a lot of his work, so the thinking went, similarities in animal design pointed to a common designer. A few years later, along comes Darwin and he figured that these structural similarities were important evidence for his theory of evolution. So, rather than a common designer, he instead credited common ancestry. But which is the proper explanation for these obvious similarities? Enter biologist Tim Barra. Guys, 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 I've got a really good illustration. It'll totally put this question to bed. If you look at a 1953 Corvette and compare it to the latest model, only the most general resemblances are evident. But if you compare a 53 and 54 side by side and so on, the descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious. The evidence is so solid and comprehensive that it can't be denied by reasonable people. In using this analogy, Dr. Barra actually demonstrates precisely the opposite of what he intended. Here's why. A succession of even very similar forms doesn't demand common descent. It could, in this case it does, instead point to a common designer. These guys, the engineers at Chevy. Intelligent agents are free to reuse things however they want. Just like I use the same password, Fluffy Bunny 123 for everything I do online. So the question remains open, is homology due to common design or common descent? Because the argument was so central to Darwin's case, his followers eliminated the question by simply redefining the word from simple similarity to meaning similarity due to common ancestry. They baked Darwinism into the definition of the word. Homology now typically means similarity due to common ancestry. It's a clever way to end an argument if you can get away with it, but for anybody paying attention, it's a baldly circular one. Common ancestry because common ancestry. We gotta, we gotta flag, flag all the play, play. circular reasoning, illegal, illegal use of logic, logic five yard penalty, repeat, repeat the fourth grade. grade. Oh, come on, no serious biologist could possibly make that mistake. Nobody defines homology that way and then uses it as evidence for evolution. Come on, people couldn't possibly be that dumb. The circular argumentation is still regularly used in high school, even college level textbooks, and many a YouTube video. The surprising thing is that many otherwise very smart people didn't realize this. However, more and more people are seeing the problem for what it is. So what are the options in trying to solve this problem and escape the vicious circularity? Seeing their success at redefining homology, some try to redefine circular reasoning too. Huh, all right, let's, let's see here. Whoa, 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 it's not circular reasoning. Let's call it uh, reciprocal illumination. Fancying up a term doesn't really change the argument. Did you order a pizza? I told you I'm making meatloaf. Well, this isn't pizza. It's an elliptical caloric transmission device. Oh, okay. Gahool. Wait a second. Other attempts were made to escape the circularity, but they had to give up on homology as evidence. And instead, they looked to other lines of evidence for common ancestry, namely DNA. Eyeballing bones was a bit subjective anyway. It's kind of like trying to guess what someone's thinking by looking at their face. <laughs> oh wow, I wonder why he looks so sad. You think somebody died? It's hit or miss. But if you could look deeper by, say, reading his diary, you'd be able to see what's going on with far more precision. Dear diary, Today was all you can eat Taco Tuesday and I forgot to wear my stretchy pants. I could only eat seven tacos and they forgot to add extra guac. This day couldn't get any worse. This is pretty much exactly what scientists do when sequencing DNA. They're able to move to the more objective realm of cold, hard numbers. If you look at different creatures' DNA, the rule of thumb is the more similar, the more closely related and vice versa. Biologists expected to see a gradual branching path of DNA mutations from species to species and they did find some success. Take for instance, this little guy. He's a gene called cytochrome C. 
You can find a version of him in such places as your handsome or beautiful self, chimpanzees, dogs, moths, even yeast. He's one of the most commonly sequenced portions of DNA, so it's a great test case to see if the similarities hold up and point toward common ancestry. So, if we compare your cute little cytochrome C to this ugly, hairy chimpanzee cytochrome C, they look exactly alike. Weird. With dogs, there's about 90% similarity. Moths, about two-thirds similar. And yeast, only about half similarity. Wow, just what we'd expect. These results must be really strong evidence of common ancestry. Whoa, 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 whoa. no! Who let you in here? Shoo! Get out of here! Meet Cytochrome B. He's a lot like C, except he likes to throw monkey wrenches into Darwin's expectations. He's just one example of many. If Darwinism is true, we should be able to construct a reasonably consistent family tree, pretty much no matter what genes we compare. But that's far from the case. In reality, using genes like Cytochrome C as evidence for common ancestry is just a good example of molecular cherry picking. Depending on what genes are used, biologists will come up with wildly different ancestry and contradictory trees of life. Comparing different animals, cytochrome B genes, scientists found cats and whales cavorting in the primate club, kicking poor little cute little tarsiers out into the cold, frogs and birds and fish carrying on together in their own strange little group, and even sea urchins masquerading as chordates. It's madness! Molecular evidence, as it turns out, does very little to support homology. It's basically a big, wet blanket for the hopeful biologists who study the field. So, homology can't be used as evidence for evolution because it assumes the very thing it's trying to prove. And when biologists try to fix it by pointing to DNA or other areas, it only further undermines the case. Now, to be fair, doing away with homology doesn't necessarily disprove Darwinism, but it is illustrative of the kind of lazy thinking that's common among many Darwinists. Bad arguments can simply get passed on uncritically. All homology proves is that scientists are just like everyone else, people, and we can be uncritical of things that we want to believe. But what about all the other lines of evidence? We've got biogeography, embryology, antibiotic resistance, whale evolution, even vestigial organs for crying out loud. Is this kind of lazy thinking when dealing with evidence for evolution a one-off mistake in biology, or is it more pervasive? That's a great question for another video.